Hi there. I guess I better unmute. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Cassandra Furman, for those who don't know me. And do, do folks have cameras? It would be kind of nice to see our faces as we chat about the um, goal three. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> be brave, you guys. <laughs> I was going to see if earlier, I can turn but... mine on. Okay, yeah. see if you can. If you can, it's... Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hello. Thank you. It's good to see you, Cassandra. This is Sarah Taves. Hey, Idaho. Sarah, I, I'm imagining your face because <laughs> I know you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Oh, so let's see here. Would you guys like me to share? I have all the outcomes uh, on one paper. Would that be useful to you as we talk about um, the goal three outcomes? Hi, Frederick. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and just share that um, and see if, uh, can you all see this? Those are the goal three outcomes. And I'm assuming you all can see it. So we can, uh, the, the first question they'd like us to talk about is um, which of these outcomes have you focused most on in your state in recent years and why? So are there any of these outcomes that have been a focus of your work? Uh, I would say uh, 3.2 is out of all of these. I, a lot of them, you know, we've talked about and have had, uh, you know, strategic discussions about how to address them, especially the kinship families. Uh, but 3.2, I think, is one we could actually say we did this to try to do that, which um, self-directed vouchers was one strategy we used to um, help meet unique needs. <clears throat> So that would be three out, outcome 3.2. Does anyone, so the vouchers mm -hmm. are one example of how you've done that. Mm -hmm. Self-directed Self uh, in particular, yeah. yeah. Anyone else focused on, I mean, 3.2 seems like a pretty, that's what I would imagine most folks would be focused on because that's what you're doing. You mm -hmm. know, lifespan respite program. Um, and yeah, then, I yeah, self-directed. Take... Yeah, sorry, the self-directed, and then um, like our grants are focused on reaching rural and um, frontier areas, which to, is kind of a unique need, also not you know not a characteristic of the caregiver, but where they're located. Right, Sarah, you were about to say something too. Yeah, I think that self-directed respite has been a really powerful move in terms of enabling and really facilitating families being able to find respite providers because they can now, you know, utilize their neighbor or their nephew. Uh, and in rural and remote areas, that's been really critical. I think we've also been working on 3.1, uh, culturally appropriate uh, programming specific to the Latinx population. Uh, we we have a, a bilingual we have bilingual navigators that have been working on this challenge and really have identified you know how do we bring the language to to really appreciate and embrace the Hispanic culture which is very family centric and you know but but almost to its detriment in that it's really hard to to think about how you help support from the outside because it is such a, a natural component of family to care. And we've been thinking about it. We're based at the university. We've been thinking about it. You know, how do we enable young people to go on to college when they also shoulder some of the cultural norms around responsibility to family, caregiving, and, and working with our universities and colleges to think about supports for students who are also juggling caregiving responsibilities. Um, Gosh, the other, a, that, I'm sorry, I, I, I was, I'm fascinated by that. And I'd love to hear some more of the successes or if anyone has questions, Sarah, 
I'm very interested. Yeah, I will share the report that um, was generated. We we have a phase one, we have completed the report on it, and then we've just completed phase two, which was actually reaching out to providers across the country who have worked to deliver programming to Hispanic um, populations and what are their lessons learned to try to compile those. And one of the key takeaways there is this, this intersection between cultural awareness and appropriateness and language, you know, that we really think critically about having language skills and language abilities if we're going to be a you know, authentically engaged with the community, a language line just isn't isn't it at all. So I think that's been one of those pieces that has been um, most striking in terms of the lessons learned we've in visiting with programs across the country that have worked in this space. Yeah, I was also really interested in the work with colleges and universities to yeah. help young caregivers, and I. Yeah. I want to make sure I heard that correctly. You're helping them somehow complete their ed secondary education. Is that what I'm hearing? That's, yep, that's right. That's really wanting to, to fold in, you know, colleges offer writing supports and, you know, test taking and all sorts of academics programming and also some wellness. But, you know, when we think specifically about the, the needs and pressures of a student juggling family caregivers responsibilities, those are pretty invisible. And so we are in the process of uh, initiating a survey. We wanna try to quantify how many students you know, are in this role of a, a caregiver, but that gets pretty complicated because we don't even really know the language to use in terms of you know people see themselves as a caregiver or so it's very interesting, but yeah, working with our academic success programs, working with our trio programs, um, working with our colleges of engineering, really anybody who will listen to us, um, we've been at their door um, offering, uh, what we offer is a free caregiver navigation um, support network. And, and so wanting to make sure that universities and colleges know that's available uh, and then in trying to help quantify this, that that may raise the um, interest level in uh, providing students with su supports. Yeah. Hey, Sarah, um, this is yeah. a kind of an off topic, but I have some information that I could send mm -hmm. to you about a group who's doing um, similar work on that language of like how to talk to kids about caregiving and their role in their homes as caregivers. Um, they're in Colorado, it's called the Healthy Kids Colorado Survey, and it's something that they administer in high schools. And um, a woman oh. that we worked with in Colorado worked with a group out of Rhode Island who was doing it in Rhode Island and uh, trying to get this survey on this. And, and they just spent a lot of time working on the language of how to even ask kids about like if is there someone in your home that you take care of um, and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I'd love to send that to you. Oh, Aaron, Do you mind sharing that with the whole group? Oh, yeah, I would love it if you send it to me or Jill. We could make sure others get it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's there. If you want to send me your email address, I can include you too. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Boy, the language is such a huge piece of all of this. You know, getting the words right. Yeah. the The other objective that we've done some initial work is number ten three point one zero. Yeah, I was um, hoping yeah. to hear about that one. Yeah. So, so one of the projects we've done with our Office of Drug Policy is to conduct some qualitative interviews with kinship families who are kinship because of substance use disorders. And the findings have been really stunning. You know, the grief that the parents are feeling and guilt and, you know, so it's not only the I'll say burden, but but this responsibility of caring for kids, but it's also their own internal tension that they're carrying around because of what their child, where their child is in this substance use disorder reality. So we're, we're continuing to work with our Office of Drug Policy and Behavioral Health Systems. Um, we want to get connected with the correctional systems is kind of our next step is how upon incarceration could we 
send the families of the incarcerated individual, you know, resources that would help direct them to kinship supports um, and, and family supports. Because we, we, it's hard to find these families, mean, it's hard for families to identify as such. And so looking for some opportunities of readiness to uh, accept resources or, and, and just knowing who they are. So that's been our kinship um, piece that's been pretty exciting. And I think it's got some real potential to um, serve not only as a, you know, tertiary prevention, but primary prevention. I mean, can we get to these families so we can support the kids as they struggle with, you know, the reality of what that their family setting is. And, you know, it's all about respite as well. You know, how do we get these grand families some respite? Um, yeah. Is anyone else uh, focusing efforts on outcome 10 or yeah, kinship families? Uh, I I thought about that one. I, I don't know that we are necessarily focusing efforts, but what we found is that they almost wound up being part of our um, programs, like accidentally and through word of mouth. Um, and especially through, we have um, work a lot with foster families and there, um, I was going to ask you, Sarah, if there is any like discussion in your state over like the kinship family that we work with, like wish that they could have access to foster family resources and they currently, they're not recognized as foster families, but they identify as foster families. So I, I thought that was very interesting in what we've learned working with these families, but I can't say that we necessarily focused on it. Um, I can't say that we focused on it, but we do end up working with a lot of these uh, caregivers. Yeah, there are, I, I think you're exactly right. I think, you know, many of the kinship families in Idaho, um, they are envious. The foster family supports like, you know, even just monetary re, uh, support for number of kids in the household or that they're caring for $309 a month, regardless of how many kids you have. Whereas in foster care, it's quite a bit different. But there is a real divide there as well. Most of these kinship families do not want to have anything to do with state because they are afraid of the children being taken and put in, in, into, into foster care. So we, yeah, it's still a pretty rough edge there yeah yeah that that makes sense yeah a friend of mine went into respite yeah. care because she was working in the social service um uh, in, with the, in the foster care system and she re she was talking to some birth parents and they said you know if we were given the same support you're giving those foster parents we would have ne you know we'd still have our children you know, if we'd had the respite yep. that you're providing yep. foster families with, if we'd had these supports, and um, she um, is a, a great proponent of respite and has been working in the system now for years, Trump, based on just that, you know, gosh, let's let's support families uh, without having to remove children to do it. Um, any yeah. other, okay, the, we're, I'm hearing, we, we've named three that it sounds like you're focusing on. And that was the person and outcome one, person and family centered, trauma informed, culturally appro uh, appropriate. Also family caregivers uh, meeting their unique needs, 3.2 and 3.10. Any, any other work going on in the, uh, the remaining seven? Um, I would say for us, 3.3 uh, is um, I, more something that we kind of have to make sure that we're providing, which is like stress management education and support groups. And then, oh, um, the counseling piece of this, we haven't gotten to focus on that yet, but it's something that we want to. Um, what we've talked about is trying to make our vouchers, our respite care vouchers available for counseling services somehow, um, because there is such an, you know, so much evidence with the benefit of counseling. Um, so yeah, it's not something we're doing yet, but something we really, um, the mental health, you know, focus on mental health um, is something we want to put more focus into in the future. 
Thank you, Aaron. So that looks like um, the one that you'd like to explore further. Are there any others, uh, other outcomes that you would like to put more time and energy in uh, that are you'd like to learn more about, more intriguing to you? It looks like we just lost Lynn, darn it all. <laughs> um, I was going to say... Um... The, oh, the volunteer, uh, the 3.6, the being trained and vetted, there's been some discussion um, in, with our group and, and our state in the past about uh, like a, some kind of caregiver certification, but honestly, it has kind of, I mean, it's never really, nothing's ever come of it, and I don't find that people are, um, I don't hear often that like I have access to respite care, but it's not good. Like I, I want better care. It's more, we're still at the point of, we just need to get them access to some kind of care. So, you know, just to, um, you know, guess as to why that's kind of fallen off of a priority that the like vetting, well, not vetting, we do like background checks and caps checks and stuff like that is still very much um, a requirement and kind of the floor of, um, um, qualifications, but, um, but yeah, anyway, this, this whole idea of like a caregiver certification, I just, I've, I've heard it, you know, like whispers of it here and there, but then nothing ever really comes up of it. So. Erin, forgive me for not knowing what state are you from? Colorado. You're from Colorado. Okay. Uh, you're from, are you familiar with the training that they're doing in Wisconsin right now? The, um, caregiver it's, it's a, a pilot where they're oh. studying caregiver training. No, I, I may have heard of it, but I haven't like looked into it now. Yeah, it's a pilot right now. And we'll, we'll, uh, it, you know, since you're hooked up with Arch right now, you're going to hear, you'll be hearing a lot more about it. Um, okay. I think there are positives and negatives. I, I, I wonder about requiring caregiver training, because would that mean it would exclude uh family members, for example, who might want to provide rest, but I mean, they're, they're things to consider, but. Sure. Um, yeah, but yeah, good to know. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And you, you, you'll hear more, I promise. Cool. Are there any others? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think, and actually I'll touch a little bit too on um, that, training piece as well. So um, I know I'm over here in Illinois uh, with the Illinois Respite Coalition. So we were fortunate enough to, to be uh, included in that respite provider training that is free for you know all of our uh, respite providers that go uh, provide respite through our in-home program. You know, they are required to complete that training so that they get that. You know, I, I can't hear you. I don't know what's happened, but something's happened to my computer. I, I'm sorry, um, I okay. just lost sound, I'm going to go up here, shoot, I, yeah, I, up I have lost I sound, guess. Aaron and Frederick, can you, can you hear, so, okay, I, I yes. can't hear myself yes, anymore, I don't, I don't know what's happened, uh, clearly it's a computer glitch on my end, but, um, uh, you can hear, I see that. Okay, well, I can't. <laughs> and I don't know how to fix my computer either to make it. Uh, shoot. Hmm, I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can't help with? Did you hear Siri just say that? I, I can't, he I doesn't know why I can't. I heard that because it was coming out of my uh, shoot. Um, I I am so sorry, everybody. Well, um, I I feel as if I should uh, go back and ask Jill if if we can join another room. Let me see. Let's go away.
I could like uh, let, type let, the notes. Let to me you just let, let if you guys can hold on a second because I can't hear anything. I'm going to check with Jill and see what's going on if I can uh, get back there. Uh, I don't know how to get a message to Jill either. So I have just, um, uh, Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask Aaron, since I can't hear anything, I but you can hear me, so that's good to know. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and keep asking questions and uh, not know a thing that you're saying, except maybe I'll hear it in the recording later on. Um, let's talk about barriers. So what are the most common barriers you faced related to any activities related to goal three. So I'm just gonna go back and make sure you are able to see the, um, yep, the outcomes here. So if you don't mind, uh, what are some of the barriers you've experienced? Yeah, I think, Erin, you can hear me okay, right? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so I think personally for us, some of the barriers that we've um, been facing recently is really just kind of, I think it's pretty typical, but really just getting the awareness out there for people, you know, to know about, you know, these new programs that we want to, um, you know, get started with the IRC and things like that. For example, we are going to be, um, we're in the early stages of getting out a lending library for families and family caregivers that will consist of like um, iPads and Amazon Alexas that families can borrow from us at any time that can really help, you know, kind of remove that, you know, isolation or loneliness that the care recipient might be feeling, you know, from whatever, you know, disability it is that they're facing, as well as, you know, giving families the opportunity and the respite providers that opportunity to, um, you know, maybe get some more training in on learning about their loved one's disability, you know, or things that kind of get, you know, anything really that can bring that additional knowledge to how they can better serve the family and the care recipient. And so specifically with trying to get out information about that program, it's, I think a lot of just, you know, there's so many places that we can start, you know, with letting them know that this program exists for them. Um, but then actually having that follow through from everyone, you know, having that, um, you know, not being intimidated or afraid or, you know, I don't really know what feelings they might have, but, you know, just that lack of following through and, you know, accepting the help that's available. So, you know, that's something that we're, you know, kind of trying to figure out and see, you know, how we can, um, I don't know, be a little, I don't know, you know, like just better practices with making sure that, you know, when families do find out about our programs, like actually reaching out to us, you know, and following through with getting the help because it's here.
Well, it looks like there was a good answer there that I can't wait to hear when I play the recording back. So thank <laughs> you so much for that. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask one last question. I think we'll be called back to the room pretty soon. Well, we've got about four minutes. But during COVID-19, we know a lot of programs, uh, respite programs around the country really uh, shifted. They had to shifted gears and provided a lot of different types of support services to the families they were serving. And what we're curious about is, are any of the services, any of the things you did during the pandemic, are you holding on to those? Um, are they still part of your work, part of your planning for future efforts? So I'd love to hear about that. I won't hear it right now, but I'm hoping <laughs> that you can share and we'll get back to it. Thank you. So Aaron, uh, Celeste, Frederick, anything you did special during COVID-19 that you might be? I don't know if you can hear me, but yeah, I wasn't here during COVID and and I'm trying I know that kind of a lot of things with our program fell apart during COVID. So um so things we learned a lot of things not to do. <laughs> Hello, this is Frederick. Uh I just joined the mission about three weeks ago. Uh, so I I'm unable to provide the information well, of what the <laughs> It looks as if uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm really blowing it. So I think um, we can probably just wait until it's time for us to go back to the room. Frederick, new to space. Aaron was not here during COVID. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for those comments. I also was not here during COVID. I joined in a so couple, uh, a couple months know, you, ago. Aaron, <laughs> Good. Aaron mentioned uh, uh, volunteer and paid caregivers, and I'm just wondering, how are you and your partners addressing volunteer and workforce recruitment and retention right now? And uh, what barriers do you face and what opportunities do you see? Uh, I know one of the barriers Aaron mentioned was training. You know, she's wondering about the training. But uh, how are you currently uh, recruiting and preparing volunteer workforce and paid? I forgot that I can speak to everyone else. Um, a group that we work with uh, is called A Little Help. Um, and one thing that they have mentioned that's really successful for them is partnering with high schools and um, like students that need civic credits, um, that's a good um, like a pipeline for them it are these students who just need like hours here and there and a little help doesn't do, um, they might offer medical respite care, but it's mostly like chore services and companionship and um, like medication delivery and that kind of thing um, that, you know, someone who's got a background check could do. Um, that's... Um, and then another another group we work with uh, partners with medical students um, because their program is entirely volunteer based or volunteer run, but they do always have one nurse. They have a monthly respite um, event. It's like a five hour uh, respite program for kids and their siblings, uh, kids that have uh, developmental disabilities or like um, challenges at school, like are on um, IEP plans and stuff like that. Um, and they, but they um, commit to having one nurse, like a qualified nurse on site at each event and they partner with med medical schools to do that. If you can believe it, Erin, my sound went on just that minute. I heard, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I heard the very last piece. Are you working with uh, like schools of nursing schools and so forth? We don't directly, but some of our like coalition members do. So um, yeah, one is a, a like a chore service that serves mostly older, um, older, older age groups or individuals like in their uh, like 40s with um, 
like brain injuries, uh, that kind of thing. But the other one are, are kiddos and they partner with uh, medical schools to have one nurse on site for each monthly respite event. But the rest of the program is totally volunteer run. That is wonderful that you're doing that. I've, I've met a lot of nursing students who are volunteering and it's been amazing for yeah. and just nursing, social yeah. work, history. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Students who want to learn more about how to serve their community. It's been great. I guess the breakout rooms are going to close in a few minutes. I really want to apologize for my technical, but you guys saved the day for me. So thank you. I, I can't wait to hear what you had to say. <laughs> so we'll see you back in the main room. Thanks.